fairy tale opens with the words there was once a town in the heart of america where all life seemed to live in harmony with its surroundings and then gradually we find that uh, later on uh, the morning food usually throb with the birth song and uh, there would be harmony in nature uh, the children would play on the grassland etc and then gradually one on the mornings that had once throbbed with the dawn chorus of robins and other birds now there was no sound only silence lay over the fields and woods and marsh and the silencing of the spring as the title tells us at one level it is referring to the loss of birth song and on the other hand it becomes a synecdoche for something that is happening to the environment itself we remember later on from reading silent spring that this was due to the use of pesticides the pesticides actually reached the water and the water came down to uh, the smaller animals then birds and then what happened is the children fell ill because they were staying in those areas and even the children died so as a result what she is trying to do is she is trying to show a picture of a society which is harming itself it is a physical kind of an action and as students of literature we are always interested to learn that the title of this book silent spring was derived from keats's la de la belle dame sans merci a famous poem that because of the presence of a strange or mysterious woman the sage is withered from the lake and no birds sing that is the silence the uh, unnatural or supernatural silence that was talked about in the poem but in silent spring by rachel carson the witchcraft is not involved the people had done it to themselves so human beings are uh, harming themselves in this manner and this book was written in 1962 the other woman i would refer to is called cheryl glotfelty as a young woman she sent a manuscript and a proposal to a famous critic in america by that time called harold from and her argument was that she wanted to publish a book which anthologized the various kinds of voices in the world of ecotourism and uh, in this book glotfelty went on to describe ecotourism raised his voices for our uh, kind of uh, understanding as it now exists and i will refer to this book directly this book is called the ecocriticism reader landmarks in literary ecology and it is edited by cheryl glotfelty and harold from this was published in 1996 from the university of georgia press so in this book she introduces the field of ecocriticism and i'll follow her to a large extent initially glotfelty wrote that Uh, if your knowledge of the outside world were limited to what you could infer from the major publications of literary profession you would learn that towards the end of the 20th century race class and gender mattered a lot but i quote uh, you would never suspect that the earth's life support systems were under stress indeed you might never know that there was an earth at all but still from the newspapers and other articles you would learn that there were oil spills lead and asbestos poisoning toxic waste contamination extinction of species battles over public land use uh, nuclear reactor uh, disaster as in chernobyl the hole in the ozone layer uh there are so many kinds of things we learn from from newspapers learn of from newspapers but at the same time the literary studies or literary criticism keep up with this idea that was her question and she said that history philosophy law sociology religion these have been dealing with this ideas of uh, ecological importance in the 1970s theoretically but what about literature and then she says that of course this was not uh, this was not actually too difficult because 
in the world of literary criticism also there were made, various voices various distinct voices the only problem was these voices were not recognized as eco critical voices they were thought of as regional studies um american studies the study of the frontier etc etc various kinds of separate disciplines and she brings them together under this idea of eco criticism so she goes on to tell tell us that finally from the mid 1980s scholars began to collaborate and in 1990 the university of nevada reno there they created the first academic position in literature and the environment and in 1992 this is a landmark in the world of eco critical studies in 1992 the association for the study of literature uh, and environment asle asle is one of the uh, governing ideas or bodies in the world of eco criticism so asle was formed in 1992 and uh, it was trying to work on promote the exchange of ideas and information pertaining to literature that considers the relationship between human beings and the natural world so in this sense isle the interdisciplinary studies in literature and environment it was provided uh, this journal was provided in order to create a forum for such exchange of ideas now we have been talking about eco criticism for quite some time as if it is a valid body of literary criticism and uh, it exists at least since the 1980s we have just seen uh, through block uh, felty's ideas but uh, what does eco criticism mean as such uh, i will quote this from block felty herself because this is very easy to follow the definition could be like this eco criticism is the study of the relationship between literature and the physical environment now it sounds quite natural because physical environment the trees the rivers the streams the air the fire that you find around us and uh, we relate to that naturally so the relationship between literature so literature must be reflecting this kind of a physical environment in some way we find that eco criticism takes on an art centered approach to literary studies and uh, what else do we find we find that eco criticism takes as its subject the interconnections between nature and culture as a critical stance it has one foot in literature and the other on land as a theoretical discourse it negotiates between the human and the non human so what does this mean it means that uh, we are negotiating the world in a human way and trying to negotiate with it in a humane way now this idea of the world is important in eco criticism because earlier most of the critics would go on to talk about the world only in terms of the social sphere eco criticism according to block felty expands the notion of the world to include the entire ecosphere so all of us living and non living or abiotic as well as biotic and within the biotic humans and other non human creatures all of us are included in this world in this ecosphere and we must remember after lord felty that barry commoner talked about the first law of ecology and the law is everything is connected to everything else therefore we must realize how literature might play a great part in an immensely complex global system where energy matter ideas continue to interact and create this idea of eco criticism uh among the earlier voices we have to remember one particular because various critics have called uh, the field of eco criticism green studies environmental humanism various other things so one early voice requires some uh, reference and that is we have to remember the comedy of survival studies in literary ecology published in 1972 uh by uh yes by joseph w meeker and what do we find 
he mentioned the term literary ecology in this context and he was trying to talk about the study of biological themes and relationships which appear in literary works it is simultaneously an attempt to discover what roles have been played by literature in the ecology of the human species so it cuts both ways literature reflects what has been happening in the world of ecology in, the, in terms of interaction between human beings and various other species and uh, the environment or the biophysical uh, surroundings so to say on the one hand and on the other literature can by its own work shape give shape inspire to give shape to this world in its own way so what it means is this term eco criticism was possibly the first uh, kind of uh, idea uh, the, 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 the term was first coined we believe in 1978 by william rukart and william rukart uh, wrote an essay literature and ecology an experiment in eco criticism and uh, over here rukart actually restricted the idea of eco criticism to something uh, specifically related to the scientific discipline the bio biosciences discipline eco ecology what did he mean rukart meant the application of ecology and ecological concepts to the study of literature the rukart's definition is rest restrictive in this sense and some scholars still like the term eco criticism instead of environmental criticism because we make a distinction between environment and ecology now environment to us usually means what is non living you can think of the land the water uh, the trees uh, living but they are taken as non mobile usually therefore we take them as a part of our environment and ecology in contrast is about all biotic creatures that is all living creatures including human beings and the dynamic interaction dynamic means it goes on and on and on it never stops this kind of an interaction that continues in that place and we talk about an ecosystem of a desert we talk about the ecosystem of the himalayas therefore so in that place the ecological relations always exist unless and until everybody is dead so human beings are very much a part of an ecology and in this sense we are talking about circulation of ideas and we humans are in eco criticism not merely at the center we are a part of what happens in the world human beings cannot prioritize themselves we cannot think of we cannot afford to think of a merely anthropocentric world and eco criticism is one kind of an existence one kind of a critical thought in which we are under trying to understand the strong connection between all the constituent parts of this ecology of the whole world how can we negotiate uh, how can we contribute directly to it how can we change the world for Uh, and turn into a, turn it into a better place uh, in order to do this we have to think of eco criticism and eco critical activities and uh, literature cannot directly do a lot of work but sometimes it can as in the case of eco feminists we will come to that a little later but right now we have to understand as historian donald worster explained we are facing a global crisis today not because of how ecosystems function but rather because of how our ethical systems function historians along with literary scholars anthropologists and philosophers cannot do the reforming of course but they can help with the understanding now in this context when we talk about understanding we can do literature might help and eco criticism does help in the understanding of the global crisis regarding ecology etc and for that we need to understand what nature itself means i will begin 
by talking about keywords, the 1970 text, 1976 text by Raymond Williams, where he wrote that nature is perhaps the most complex word in the language, in the English language. Why did he say so? We remember nature in the Greco-Roman world or in the Eastern religions or philosophical systems, all these kinds of uh, ideas uh, regarding nature meant that nature was the overarching place, idea, and we all, all human beings, were merely a part of nature. There were other creatures, other things in nature, and taken together, this was, this, this had become important. Now, uh, later on, do we pay that much attention to nature as an overarching idea at all? Uh, Raymond Williams suggested that uh, from the 17th century, a uh, formula was arrived at to understand the creation, was to praise the creator, which means nature means we are praising God actually as the creator. And uh, we, we are, uh, we see the uh, absolute work, uh, power, absolute power of the creator through nature. Nature is the creation. So we understand the creation in order to understand the creator in the 17th century. But practically, even in the 17th century, this was just paid lip service to and forgotten basically. Nature in the 17th I'm sorry, in the 18th and 19th centuries, uh, it was seen as the material world. This is, was on nature and nature's laws, and then scientists like Newton came in, and we learned about natural laws, laws of physics, etc., which uh, governed the working of the world, so to say. Nature came to be identified with reason. We are talking about the age of enlightenment, etc. So nature came to be uh, identified with the idea of reason. And Raymond Williams wrote that the object of observation, nature, was identified with the mode of observation, which came from reason with a capital R. Nature was contrasted with what had been and what man had made of himself. So what was already there, untampered by man, created so-called naturally, versus what man was making of it. So now we have two kinds of contrasting ideas. One, we have one kind of a society which needs redemption, renewal, and we can return to nature for that. And the other is that artificial or mechanical society that we happen to be in since the 18th century especially, nature can help us cure the anomalies in this kind of a society. So basically, so far I've been trying to talk about the Enlightenment period and the Romantic period and how we should appreciate nature, we should I'm not saying that we should worship nature as in the greco roman or the Roman or the earlier Asian concepts, but at least we should try to understand what nature represented earlier in the lives of human beings. But then a problem was created uh, in the 19th century again. Nature was treated as a selective breeder. We are talking about natural selection. And nature now had even more strict laws in the sense of uh, survival, extinction, and in the 20th and 21st centuries, I would say, nature is understood in terms of activities that range from the inherent and inevitable bitter competition, as in the case of natural selection mentioned in the 19th century, to inherent mutuality or cooperation, the other end of the range, where we are trying to survive, all of us taken together. So in this sense that uh, we understand that Raymond William was perhaps absolutely right in saying that nature is indeed a complex kind of an expression capable of incorporating ideas that might be even completely opposite in general perception. Now, uh, regarding this kind of a scenario, 
we have to understand that <clears throat> when we are talking about nature, there are various kinds of definitions that come in. I'm not going to define them. I'm just trying to express them in a synoptical manner. Nature is a concept sometimes where we try to divide the natural in terms of the non-human uh, in order to specify what is human. That is one kind of an activity regarding nature. In another way, nature refers to the structures, processes, and the laws of the physical world. And in, in saying these uh, things, I'm borrowing ideas from Kate Fokker, who uh, wrote about the idea of what is nature with a question mark at the end. Now, uh, the third kind of pro idea would be, important idea would be, that the natural means we talk about rural landscape, we talk about the wilderness, we talk about animals, we talk about uh, the surrounding resources, raw materials that we find, natural resources, is one extremely important word in the world of economics, etc. And we also go on to talk about the urban or the industrial setting. So whatever is in a raw or rural condition is sometimes called natural, whereas whatever has become urban or industrial is uh, taken away from nature or it is uh, derived from nature, but is generally supposed to be better than nature, the natural condition, because it means human beings have worked on it very carefully. So these are some general ideas of nature that we deal with in ecophysicism as well. And then we go on to learn about uh, Bill McKibben, who in his book, 1989 book, The End of Nature, was trying to talk about how we have so excessively modified the earth that uh, this could well be called, according to him, the end of nature, as we know it. And every place in the world has been, uh, has been changed. We have changed the atmosphere. We, have, we are changing the weather. You realize that the patterns are changing all the time. And therefore, we have made every spot on Earth, basically, man-made and artificial. I would say that... Uh, deep inside the Mariana Trench, which means deep inside the Pacific Ocean, perhaps we have not reached and changed the situation that much. But uh, there are very few places where human presence is not detectable. So we have made the Earth largely man-made and artificial. In this sense, we have given rise to a phenomenon where Nature's independence is perhaps lost. It has lost its meaning. And nature is nothing but us, in a sense. It is in this sense that Bill McKibben was trying to talk about the end of nature. And this is also the end of an idea, the idea of an independent, mysterious force, nature, which is beyond human control. Now, we sometimes, as in recent times, Nature unleashes its force, and we are meant to understand its force again in a renewed manner. But uh, And this is beyond human control, definitely. But generally speaking, in daily life, we do not, or even in our literary life, we generally speaking do not uh, remember these things often. I would also go on after Swarnalata Rangarajan in her book, Ecocriticism, Big Ideas and Practical Strategies, mention that Bill McKibben later on wrote a book in 2010 called E-A-A-R-T-H, Art, and the spelling is somewhat different, because McKibben then proposed that Earth, I don't know how it is, it is supposed to be pronounced, E-A-A-R-T-H should be the new name for our planet, because it, is, it signifies the end of the planet as we have always known it. And now it is replaced by a planet that has been altered artfully and destructively by human action. So in this way, we are talking about nature and what we have lost 
through human activities in terms of a natural existence. In this context, we have to return to the idea of eco-criticism again through ecology. And for that, we need to unpack the significance of the idea of eco or oikos, the Greek word that it is derived from. Oikos means household or home. And when we go on to talk about critiques, we are talking about a certain kind of act of judgment as in the work of criticism. Oikos is nature in the sense that oikos represents nature of the entire world. The entire world, this earth, is our earthly home as we usually talk about it. It is the home state. And what is happening to our domestic arena? What is happening to the neighborhood in terms of the oikos or eco? We also translate it to the larger context. And we think of the entire world as our home. And in this sense, we are talking about, in eco-criticism, all those ideas which contribute to the welfare of the home or harm our home. And in this sense, we are not limiting our concepts to environment only, the condition of the air, water, or land, how we are degrading these things and uh, abusing the power of these things. We are not just talking about that. We are also talking about the entire world and the interconnectedness that we find among all creatures, including human beings, with their environment. So in that sense, eco-criticism has this objective of giving voice to nature. And nature is basically silent to us. And it has been silenced. We remember Rachel Carson, how if nature usually speaks naturally, through birth songs and the voices of the children playing on the grassland in a neighborhood, in, a, in an imaginary neighborhood in some place, or in a real neighborhood in our world. And then suddenly, due to the use of pesticides for collecting down to the children and birds and smaller creatures like squirrels, they all die or fall ill, and nature's voice is silenced then this kind of a fable, a fable for tomorrow, as in Rachel Carson's book, becomes very much a part of the eco-critical activity. Because eco-criticism eco refers to literature and tries to give voice to whatever has been silenced in the world of nature, ecology, or the marginalized presences that are rendered voiceless even in the human world. So in this sense, we try to understand what is happening to the world from various points of view. And in this, I have to mention that eco-criticism is one kind of literary critical work which we cannot afford to do only in terms of literature. The way we view literature is needed. but. We need a basic knowledge of certain economic, political, cultural ideas which relate to eco-criticism. And for that, I would refer to Greg Garrard's book, Eco-Criticism, published in 2004, in which at the very beginning, we learn about certain positions. And these positions are pretty interesting. In the sense, they oppose each other most of the time. Some of the positions say, that, uh, for example, I'll talk about the cornucopian position. Cornucopia, cornu refers to the horn, and copia, as in copious, refers to plenty. So we are talking about the horn of plenty. Cornucopian theory talks about human welfare, which can be measured in terms of, say, life expectancy, or how much pollution there has been in a certain place. And it increases with population. Uh, economic growth, and then technological progress. We all realize these things. But then we understand cornucopians go against our instincts. We believe that uh, if population of a certain place 
is polluting the place, then that is bad for the entire idea of the ecology, the environment. And going against the film, this kind of an instinctive idea, the cornucopian theorists, like the economist Julian Simon, they keep on saying that you no, know, you find some kind of a scarcity, some kind of, some kind of a problem that human beings have created in the environment. And how do you solve it? Human beings solve it. Because necessity is the mother of invention. Once you have scarcity of a certain thing, say fuel, diesel or petrol or something, fossil fuel of some kind, human beings through their resources and with the backing of capitalists will come up with R&D, research and development, and some kind of an idea, technological idea will uh, emerge with the help of which you will have substitute sources. Scarcity, therefore, is an economic problem, not an ecological problem at all. And businessmen actually profit from this kind of a situation and ultimately this circular throughout the society. So the entire economy, the entire human economy, the entire human society will benefit if they try to go on solving problems which emerge due to even of activities. So human beings, in this sense, are taken as resources, creating the problem, but also capable of solving the problem. So more people on the planet means more resourceful brains, more productive hands, more consumption, and therefore more economic growth. It is called a virtuous cycle. We have heard of vicious cycles, but this is a virtuous cycle where things go on escalating problems, but their solutions escalate too. And the result is that we are moving towards uh, a world which is going to be better and better and better. So I was trying to say that this is somewhat counterintuitive in the sense that uh, uh, cornucopian theorists generally claim that environmentalists and other kinds of ecocritics, etc., and in certain kinds of literature, there is care mongering, as if people are trying un to frighten human beings unduly about the condition of the environment, the deterioration that we have in nature. But there are problems, problems with the cornucopian theory as well. And uh, the first idea is environmentalists ag agitate and there are morally motivated consumers. There are few, but at least a few businessmen, entrepreneurs who try to create uh, solutions to environmental problems. There are government regulations. So as described in the cornucopian theory, capitalism is not the only solution. There might be other ethical positions which lead to solutions as well. Uh, the second problem with the cornucopian theory is that capitalists often solve the problem by removing damaging industries, for example, chemical industries or certain nuclear waste uh, products. These are actually dumped onto the developing countries like us. Uh, so this is not a genuine solution at all. It is just for the moment uh, putting it away and in general, it harms the entire world in the long run. The third problem with the cornucopian theory is that they do not bother about the non-human environment for its own sake at all. It, they only bother about it only when it affects human beings directly. So only when there is a kind of, uh, there is a kind of uh, problem with what you're dumping in your own backward, only then you wake up to the fact and try to do something about it. Now, that's not a proper ethical position at all. So this cornucopian theory will find uh, not many takers, I hope and believe. And at the same time, the most uh, well-known, the best known, so to say, position in this sense is environmentalism. Environmentalists are concerned about broadly environmental issues like global warming, pollution, but they do not want 
any radical change in either the social structure or in their own standard of living. Rachel Carson, Paul and Anne Ehrlich, E.O. Wilson, Stephen Snyder, these are some of the important names and because we should also remember that Rachel Carson herself act as, acted as uh, an environmental, uh, in terms of environmentalism. And we have the, the idea that environmentalism agitates, writes about, advocates literary activism uh, so that you can use science, technology, and government policies might get changed as a result. They want to actively manage the planet. And this is, um, this is paid at least some attention to by industries and governments because governments cannot afford to say that we are not bothered about the environmental deterioration. They have to say that we are concerned and we are going to create policies, uh, rules, which will eventually help everybody. And industries have to uh, implement certain rules, laws made by each and every government. For example, uh, the chimneys should not be permitted to belch out black smoke. That kind of an idea is done. So greenwashing is done by industries basically as a result of what environmentalist agitation does. The third position we have to learn about is deep ecology. Deep ecology is an idea which came from the Norwegian philosopher Arne Nes, and we also have Gary Snyder who actually wrote about it. Now Arne Nes set out eight points of deep ecology and there is a reason why this is called deep ecology and to deep ecologists environmentalism is shallow green. So we are talking about the interaction of these two ideas, the deep and the shallow, in the green studies. And in deep ecology, these eight important points set out in, uh, set out in this book, uh, Deep Ecology for the 21st Century, uh, by George Sessions. In this book, we find these eight points. I will just refer to the first point and the fourth point. In the first point, we learn the well-being and flourishing of human and non-human life on Earth has value in themselves. This has a significance. We usually think of things in the world, in our environment, as natural resources. Natural resources because they help human beings in some ways, or we can think of certain back kinds of bacteria, virus, etc., which harm human beings. So in this sense, generally speaking, we only think of other creatures and other things in this world when they affect human beings. But Arne Nils, in the first point of deep ecology, is trying to say that the well-being and flourishing of human and non-human life on Earth have value in them themselves, which is this intrinsic value or inherent worth. These values are independent of the usefulness of the non-human world for human purposes. So they exist in their own right, they flourish in their own right, or should be permitted to flourish in their own right, because you see, we are talking about the human world all the time, this anthropocentric view all the time, but we are not paying attention to the right to exist and flourish of anything else in the world and deep ecology tries to address that problem, conceptual problem. Out of the eight points mentioned by our nenes, we have the fourth point which is again very important. The fourth point is the flourishing of human life and cultures is compatible with a substantially smaller human population. The flourishing of non-human life requires a smaller human population. This is the meaning. So the population explosion, as we know it, creates the biggest problem and puts enormous stress on land, water, various kinds of what other people would call natural resources. And smaller human populations would help this. How? In developed countries, it is said, per capita, uh, consumption is too high. 
As a result, there is a problem with waste disposal. Greenhouse gas emission, emission goes up all the time. These are the problems created due to the population trends in the developed countries. In the developing countries, the problem is somewhat dif different because of many people and some kind of scarcity in job, in the job market and other places, you have poverty. As a result of poverty and gradual urbanization and industrialization in developing countries, we have deforestation, pressure on land, etc. So taken together, developed world and developing world in both the worlds, population is a key to an optimum existence. That is what Arne Nez was trying to say. Though, uh, to the, uh, we, we must remember that to the deep ecologists, environmentalism is considered to be shallow because environmentalism generally argues for preservation of natural resources, uh, rather I should say conservation, not preservation, but conservation of natural resources so that they can be used repeatedly in a better way, better management tactics, so to say. That is what uh, environmentalism is all about, according to deep ecology. And uh, in its turn, deep ecology has been criticized for being a little misanthropic. Misanthropic because, of course, you are talking about human beings, but if you take things to an extreme in the developing world, do you actually... Uh, how do you stop population explosion? One way of doing this is by killing people. So we cannot go to that extreme in order to stop the burgeoning of population in such a society, a poor society. So the problem is that uh, the third kind of problem actually with the idea of deep ecology is that Arne after all, said that uh, if vital human needs are concerned, then they override the good of any other living thing. He didn't give this example, but I'm trying to tell you. For example, you have a man-eater, a tiger who has turned man-eater. What do you do? From this perspective as well, and from every other perspective, you will think of human welfare, the life of the human being, and you will kill the tiger. It will not be beneficial to the tiger itself. So we see that deep ecology is deeper in a sense than environmentalism, so to say. But how deep it is, I'll leave it to your kind of appreciation or idea. Now, the problem with uh, deep ecology not, notwithstanding, we have to think of two more kinds of position. One is ecofeminism. In ecofeminism, we find that uh, I'll begin with certain definitions, dates, names, etc., and then go on to talk about what ecofeminism actually means. Uh, it is said that in the 1970s, that is in 1972, there was this French writer, Francois Dubon, who founded the Ecology Feminism Center in Paris. And in 1974, she used the term ecofeminism in her book. The book was called Feminism or Death. And there she called upon women to lead an ecological revolution to save the planet. Francois Dobon saw pollution, destruction of the environment, runaway population growth as problems created by a male culture. The planet itself was in danger of dying, taking humanity along with it. So a society recast in the feminine principle would not mean power in the hands of women instead of men. What would it mean? It would mean that there would be no such power that could harm the world in such a way at all. That is the aspiration of ecofeminism initially. In the United States, ecofeminism was developed by Ines Strucking at the Institute of Social Ecology in Vermont around 1976. And uh, there were various kinds of conferences, seminars, spontaneous street demonstrations by women 
that had happened during the 1970s in the USA and in Europe in various ways. And uh, this continues till today. And so when we begin to talk about ecofeminism, we talk about a certain kind of ethics related to it. And there was a philosopher, Karen Warren, and Warren talked about this kind of an concept, of a concept. I'll quote from Karen Warren. An ecofeminist ethic is both a critique of male domination of both women and nature, and an attempt to frame an ethic free of male gender bias about women and nature. It not only recognizes the multiple voices of women located differently by race, class, age, ethnic consideration, it centralizes those voices. Ecofeminism builds on the multiple perspectives of those whose perspectives are typically omitted or undervalued in dominant discourses. For example, Chipko women. So, ecofeminism basically is culturally and structurally pluralistic, inclusivist, contextualist. Now, if these are heavy expressions, then we need to understand these expressions clearly first. It is generally said that women have an ethical idea based on care, love, and trust. And men often want to have enough time in their hands, enough physical scope to go and hunt and gather and later have war. So warfare, other kinds of out-of-home games, all these belong to the male sphere, it is usually said. And women, because of their childbirth and other kinds of responsibilities in bringing up the children, young children, infants, etc., they lead a more or less domestic kind of a life. So if we accept this kind of a role, uh, I know you will talk about essentialization and you will talk about how it is not always women who care, men also might care. These are all valid arguments. But generally speaking, to certain classes of feminists and later on ecofeminists, there was a starting point. And at the starting point, we would begin by saying in ecofeminism that there is this Mother Earth rhetoric which is used. Mother Earth is like a mother, and women are potentially or real mothers. Therefore, this ethic of care and concern and love, bestowing love, this is something which becomes very important in ecofeminism. When we use the Mother Earth rhetoric, we are talking against, we are protesting against the destruction of the wilderness. We are talking against the mobilization of um, nuclear power, nuclear waste being dumped everywhere in the world. We are talking against toxic threats to women, bo women's bodies and to unborn children. And in this sense, how do you reconcile many of these ideas? Because we are actually, uh, we actually have a big problem. The problem is of a partnership ethic. Partnership ethic means that we have to think compulsorily in terms of a partnership ethic as described by Carolyn Merchant in Radical Ecology, the search for a livable world. Otherwise, we might well go extinct. How will this happen? Suppose a world scenario in which every nuclear device created somehow accidentally gets activated. The result will be all human beings might perhaps die. And most of the species, other kinds of plant as well as animal species, might also suffer great losses. The world might still continue to exist, but are we going to be there? 
I'm still talking in terms of an anthropocentric position, I understand. But at the same time, if we are thinking of survival, how can we survive? One possible way is to follow the radical ecology uh, specified partnership model. Among human beings, we can think of male and female creatures as partners. And we can also think of, according to Carolyn Merchant, we can also think of uh, the non-human nature and human beings as partners in existence. So this would affect every level, the personal, household, political relations. There would be no kind of domination then, and therefore human partners, regardless of sex, race, class, must give each other time and must give the non-human, non-dominating relationships time so that everybody flourishes together. So in this sense, this sounds extremely difficult, I would say, uh, because we have not been able to reach anywhere near this goal, this beautiful goal. Rather, we keep on introducing new technologies which keep on harming human beings, women, nature, children, marginalized figures, for example, farmers in, uh, in debt traps who have to commit suicide to get out of it. And why would this condition arise at all? We are talking about mostly male, male farmers, though. Uh, for example, in certain Indian states, we have seen that because of the Green Revolution or because of certain uh, propaganda about high yielding seeds which come from multinational companies as a mark of neoliberal, uh, I'm sorry, neo colonial practices, these seeds are high yielding, but they also need enormous amounts of money in order to provide proper irrigation, proper pesticides. And for that, this uh, farmers, once who have let themselves into the system, they cannot get out easily and they have to borrow my money at exorbitant rates which they have no uh, possibility of returning later perhaps. And as a result, some time later, for generations to suffer with the entire family or sometimes the farmer takes the shorter way out by committing suicide. So such marginalized figures who are related to the land or other natural resources, again, a natural resources is a term we should not use, but I am using it for better understanding right now. Uh, so when these kinds of creatures are related to all these situations, Ecofeminism doesn't talk about rape of nature and ravishing women or oppressing women only. Ecofeminism goes on to talk about all marginalized figures in the world and nature and the relationship between nature and such figures and how this entire world is suffering along with these types of human beings or non-human creatures. So non-humans, people who are sexually, racially, culturally different from ourselves, nature, all things come into the purview of ecofeminism. And uh, very quickly, I would try to mention, uh, just barely mention, because if you are interested in this, I would ask you to take a good look at Radical Ecology by Carolyn Merchant, where she sets out what liberal ecofeminism means. And we understand that uh, in liberal ecofeminism, we are talking about uh, better science, better conservation. Hello? Yes, somebody time trying to speak. OK, to resume. In, in, in ecofeminism, that is liberal ecofeminism, we learn about better science, better conservation, better laws, better approaches to resolving resource problems. And for that, liberal ecofeminists ask for 
better or equal educational opportunities so that become they can, they can become scientists better manager hello professor kundu suna jacche can you hello? hear me hello can you hear me am i audible yes ma'am uh, so uh, uh, i don't know how to praise uh, this lecture i uh, one thing i can say that it's a, it's a wonderful uh, uh, presentation and thought provoking obviously so ma'am okay. uh, shall i so i will continue right so i can hear voices at the background and i really don't know how to deal with that in order to mute them out so i hope the organizers will mute those voices for me i will continue in the sense that in liberal ecofeminism we are talking about improving the condition of the environment the conservation of the natural resources and a higher quality of life for everybody involved and for this there were many kinds of alliances and environmental uh, activist bodies created one of the famous bodies would be the green belt movement the green belt alliance was founded in 1958 and uh, uh this kind of liberal feminism do not want to label themselves as very radical they want better management and improvement of the world that is the idea the second kind of idea is called cultural ecofeminism in which the a crucial response is in terms of the perception that women and nature have been mutually associated and devalued in western culture both taken together and devalued and in this context sherry otner's 1974 article is female to male as nature is to culture question mark this article poses the problem and it says women as opposed to men have been seen closer to nature because of their physiology i was talking about how they have to spend a lot of time at home taking care of children or giving birth or for some other purpose of that sort nursing etc whereas men have the time to go outside so psychologically women are given the task of greater emotional capacity uh, taking care of the particular personal homestead etc etc are and men are supposed to be related in a better way to abstract thinking so cultural ecofeminism talks about moving out of this dilemma in terms of liberating women and nature to direct political action this stands at one end of the uh, cultural ecofeminism spectrum of activities on the other hand they also celebrate mother goddesses the concept of the mother goddess of yore and uh, how mother goddesses were once supposed to be uh, dethroned by male gods and as a result nowadays we have a wo- world in which war matters a lot and not peace enough such a deeply masculine exploitative nature exploitation of nature is something that uh, women are not supposed to like quite a lot according to cultural ecofeminists again you can talk about essentialization a kind of essentialization about gender roles that is ta- that is taking place over here but cultural ecofeminists try to get us in touch with our earlier primitive self when we were not pretending to do all these things in the name of progress we were merely trying to survive and for that the natural forces were worshiped sometimes as goddesses sometimes the moon was worshiped sometimes the reproductive system and whatever goddess stood for it was worshiped because they were interested in life and survival so revisioning nature in these ways is a part of cultural ecofeminism and uh, the crucial kind of activism that is undertaken on the streets 
is also a part of this kind of cultural ecofeminism and we are so of the love canal homeowners association in new york in 1978 because of a chemicals and plastic factory in the neighborhood uh, of 1200 homes they found that there were health problems recurring health problems uh, at the local elementary school and uh, they were there were miscarriages still birth birth defects as a result this lower middle class women, women had to protest and this kind of activism could be a part of cultural ecofeminism as well so we have not in my back backyard nimbi kind of a movement not in anybody's backyard naya bi kind of a movement not on planet earth no kind of a movement these are all incidents that had taken place in terms of what we later come to know as cultural ecofeminism the third kind we should mention is social ecofeminism and janet bell in 1988 described this as accepting the basic tenet of social ecology that the idea of dominating nature stems from the domination of human by human and for that we need to we need not do any goddess worshiping as in cultural ecofeminism i mentioned at the beginning of this discussion that uh, sometimes eco critical ideas oppose each other as in ecofeminist positions so this is one of the positions social ecofeminism would never uh, align itself with the cultural ecofeminists who wor worship earlier goddesses rather social ecofeminism advocates the liberation of women to overturning economic and social hierarchies and for this they say both men and women are capable of an ecological ethic of caring equally well and therefore we have to think of the position taken by val plumwood an australian philosopher eco philosopher and she was talking about the eco social feminism now in order to understand val plumwood's position we have to think of a kind of dualism that exists in our perception since the enlightenment we always think in terms of male female culture nature master slave white black heterosexual homosexual these are deep seated ideas in the western culture and she said if you think of culture nature male female and every in every way the first of the dual idea is taken as superior to the uh, next one the second one so male is superior to female culture is superior to nature uh, according to the western ideas plum would argue that reversing this trend will not matter much because it will continue with the idea of the dualism even then for example if women are given the reign and uh, men are supposed to serve them as women are serving them quote unquote serving them right now then it will not matter much because ultimately there will be this duality in the idea of superior inferior power full power less etc what she wanted in terms of eco social feminism is doing away with this idea of hierarchy and domination completely she was talking about fighting the web of oppression by removing duality and hierarchy conceptually altogether this is very difficult to achieve and therefore we also have certain other kinds of ideas of ecofeminism for example in socialist ecofeminism socialist in socialist ecofeminism there are various kinds of ideas related to production and reproduction as in socialism for example it is said that women earlier used to interact with nature directly but under capitalism men actually dominate the production of uh, commodities exchange of commodities and women are meant to have the responsibility of reproduction and also taking care of the work for social relations these kinds of things and in this situation reproduction has been made 
inferior or subordinate to production. So if we take this as a basic postulate, then what happens? We are trying to talk about a world in which life should be one of the most important things we should talk about. And reproduction is taken in terms both biological and social in the sense that children must be given birth to biological reproduction and children must be taught to uh, children must be taught to grow up into human beings, social reproduction, so to say. So the challenge is in terms of sustainability. Sustainability, the maintenance of the ecological, productive, reproductive balance between human and nature, and this is what socialist ecofeminism tries to achieve. Now, the problem is, that they go on, socialist ecofeminists keep on talking about very, very basic problems. They're not just talking about abstract theories. A very basic problem is, suppose third world countries, uh, we earlier we used to talk about third world countries, suppose the women of the global south are made to rent out their wombs. This would come or rather prenatal or before birth sex determination and killing of the girl child in its mother's womb, this would mean that to social ecofeminists, the idea of production is still superior to reproduction. Even reproduction is being tampered with in so many ways. In vitro fertilization giving rise to designer babies is another way of talking about it. Organ transplant and for that giving birth, stem cell research and producing babies which might go on to help other uh, human beings. All these kinds of genetic engineering, genetic research, all these kinds of things are opposed to reproductive freedom. And socialist ecofeminism actually protests against this. So, uh, so far we have seen women in this position, but for ecofeminism, and in order to move from ecofeminism to post-colonial ecocriticism, we have to think of Vandana Shiva, a very prominent physicist turned ecofeminist, who has a book with Maria Mice called Ecofeminism. And there, the position is in, development, in developing countries in terms of development, women have a particular kind of role to play and they have been made victims along with nature. I was talking about the green revolution and how seeds, fertilizers, pesticides, dam, irrigation, uh, and uh, villages being made to move from one place to another, etc land conversion, import, import, uh, imported kinds of grasses, fertilizers, all these things, meaning so much money is being transformed from one country to another. Exchange is uh, grow better, no doubt. But at the same time, what about women's subsistence? What about women's survival? Because they are displaced, they are suffering from various kinds of problems and they are actually not permitted to do things in the very, very traditional, eco-friendly way that perhaps women belonging to their families many generations ago knew how to implement. And in this sense, Vandana Shiva wrote that uh, there are in India today two paradigms. She was talking about forestry as one example. And she said one is life enhancing and the other is life destroying. So it depends on women, it depends on uh, ecofeminists, which kind of a maximization of profit they would try to argue against and which paradigm, the life sustaining paradigm, they would try to implement as in ancient forest ideals, forest culture in India. And Chipko, was one grassroots level movement of this sort where 
in 1972 to 1978 in the garhwal himalayas we found that women would actually go to the forest for fruits tubers seeds leaves uh, fuel fodder everything would be given to them perhaps for their survival by the forest and if people came from outside and in the name of commercialization commercial purposes tried to cut down this forest then what the women hug the trees spontaneously they said that they would have to be cut down too before the trees could be cut down so chipko is literally tree hugging such movements became part of vandana shiva's description of the feminine paradigm of movement activity action activism and giving they also gave rise to literature this kinds of movements so taken as a whole this kind of activism is what a certain class of literary uh, eco feminists would also continue to talk about i think i will just stop over here right now because in uh, in 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 the sense we actually learn about five waves five waves of um, eco criticism so to say the kind of theories that came up uh, decade by decade and uh, if we think of this waves i will just mention this waves and leave the post colonial eco criticism kind of an idea for the second lecture which will take place half an hour after this end and there we will find that uh, post colonial eco criticism is something which affects us in india and in indian literature we will try to catch a glimpse of this kind of an expression but for the present i'll just stop by referring to the five stages or waves of eco critical theory and you will find a detailed description of this in swarnalatha rangarajan's book on eco criticism i mentioned it uh, a little while ago now the waves idea was given to us by lawrence guell and he was talking about the first two waves of eco criticism in 2005 in a book called, uh, titled the future of environmental criticism and scott sloving the first president of asle built on guell's web metaphor and he talked about the third fourth uh, the other waves to say in an article called see sick among the waves of eco criticism the first wave which is supposed to have started in the 1980s define nature as natural environment in guell we find this and there was literary non fiction representation of non human nature and wilderness in british and american literature this ask for the protection and preservation of the natural environment from human activities which harmed these things ecofeminism was becoming prominent too during this phase in the second wave which happened in the mid 90s there was a movement away from nature writing to an inclusive dialogue which included urban landscapes rural landscapes and uh, wilderness uh, stories were already there now there were multicultural voices and multiple genres and we have johnny adamson and other people writing books like the environmental justice reader during this period in 2002 the third wave approximately dates back to the year 2000 and uh, there was a tendency uh, over here the comparative tendency and in 2009 a special issue of melus multi ethnic literatures of the united states it had a journal which spoke about the third wave as a movement which explores all facets of human experience from an environmental viewpoint and it also talks about diversity of voices contributing to the understanding of the human relationship to the planet the fourth wave 
was defined by Scott Slovak in the editor's note to the autumn 2012 issue of ISLE, the Journal of Air Asle, ASLE. And there, uh, the focus was on theory of the fundamental materiality of environmental things, places, process, forces, and experiences. He was trying to talk about the inherent materiality of the human body and the natural world. Slovik specifically mentioned that he was not talking about end dates. It started on a certain date, but all those waves might well be continuing in certain parts of the world simultaneously. That is why they are called waves. And they remain meaningful even today, though they existed perhaps 20 years ago. So these are certain kinds of ideas related to the waves. And one more concern is to talk about the rhizome. The figure of the rhizome, as described by Deleuze and Guattari, means that we are not talking about a specific beginning or an end. And in ecocriticism, this is a beautiful concept in the sense that uh, it is a metaphor which works in the post-colonial and post-foreign context while we are describing ecocriticism. In this idea, the ecological interrelatedness of a non-hierarchical, we have learned about why non-hierarchical concepts are important from Pal Plumwood already. But in rhizome theory, we go farther and we talk about not only a non-hierarchical, but we also talk about a, a center, no center. So no center, therefore no periphery. And everybody is equal to everybody else in that sense. So non-hierarchical models of communication, coordination, no beginning, no end, but rather moving in different directions simultaneously and giving rise to an interrelated existence, interrelated movement. This is the last idea that we deal with right now in ecocriticism, apart from the idea of inherent materiality of the world and the body. So I will stop over here and uh, ask for questions. And then we will take a little break and move on to the second lecture. So yes, if there are questions. Thank you, ma'am. So uh, now without further delay, I uh, request the participants uh, to uh, ask. I can't hear very clearly. Could you please? Uh, uh, I, I want it to be a little clear. I can't hear that clearly. So, uh, okay, ma'am. Yes. Uh, th uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, so now, uh, without further delay, I invite questions from the participants if they do have any, so uh, they can ask you directly. So uh, now it's time for questioning. So yeah, I want this sound to be a little clear because you're very faint. I can barely catch the words. Actually, ma'am, uh, I think network uh, is uh, going down. It's a uh, running. Slow. Okay. Okay. Uh, my network. No, no, no. Uh, it's um, uh, my network. No. Oh. Okay. So, uh, uh, they are writing in the comment box, so I request them to uh, ask you directly, uh, uh, rather writing in the comment box. Oh, uh, right. Uh, uh, I have found a question from. Uh, Didesh Shudroy. Uh, I'm trying to read it. The last leaf. Yes. Uh, I would rather say that Berman actually um, Berman actually sacrifices his own life. So far as I remember the last leaf, Berman sacrifices his own life in order to save that young girl from dying. Uh, if the last leaf is lost, then she would die. That was her belief, I remember. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but Borman sacrifices his life. And would you say that this is uh, showing a lack of a noticeable want of mutual cooperation? That is what it is it's being shown over here. I would rather oppose that idea. And I would say that Borman is sacrificing his life specifically because he understands the value of cooperation and he understands the value of sustainability. Sustaining the younger girl's life 
is more important to him than staying alive all by himself because he thinks his is a sterile kind of a life yes hmm can you hear me yes i hello uh, yes uh, hello ma'am yes this is to bidesh uh did you hear me ha hello ma'am am i audible yes is this bidesh it's ma'am i am mohan duidas okay yes ma'am i have a question to ask uh, mm -hmm. first of all uh, heartfelt high regards to you for your outstanding lecture and i have been greatly inspired by your lecture though you have uh, though you have um, discussed uh, about ecofeminism uh, at the last portion of your lecture um, in a broad uh, way yet uh, i have a question ma'am uh, two theories uh, ecofeminism and uh, ecocriticism is there uh, any strong uh, connection or uh, direct influence uh, between each other and uh, which theory was uh, developed first and uh, inspired other to develop they are not separate theories eco criticism you should take as an umbrella an overarching idea and eco feminism or other kinds of social positions for example the environmentalist position or the deep ecologist position the eco feminist position these positions would very much be included in what we call eco criticism as the overarching idea so does that answer your question it is not a question of which came first the hen or the egg actually we are talking about both the hen and the egg simultaneously in eco criticism can you hear me yes Uh, Ma'am, there is a question from. Uh, I think. Uh, have, Did you? Um, could you hear me? Yes, ma'am. So uh, Mohan okay. Ruiz has uh, got this kind of thing uh, right now. So there is a question from Sheikh Tari Kali, uh, friend of mine. Uh, is, uh, Did the rise of post-materialism influence the birth of eco-criticism in the West? Uh, rise of post in influence the birth of eco criticism. No, eco criticism was born long, long ago. As I will show in my second lecture, without realizing that they were doing eco critical work, people who talked about uh, the scene, the natural scene, the rural background uh, presented in the poems of Wordsworth, for example, were doing eco critical work. The people who talked about uh, the Vedic ages. and in the vedic uh, shutras there were uh, certain kinds of ideas about nature etc this could be interpreted in an eco critical way as well hmm. so eco critical work has always existed in some form of the or the other in eco criticism is at one end we find appreciation of nature as in works work is one way of understanding and appreciating and valuing and trying to preserve nature then at the opposite end we might also talk about science fiction stories of a world which is yet to come to us and in such a world we will find certain technological developments which will perhaps destroy us perhaps help us a lot we are talking about dystopias etc and in this kind of a situation as well eco criticism works about the future which is yet to come so this entire range of appreciating nature criticizing what is done to nature through as represented through literature uh, and also going on to visualize the future in order to uh, give a warning to the people of the present all these are part of eco criticism not only in the west but everywhere in the world so eco criticism existed and i would not specifically say that post materialism the rise of post materialism uh, influenced the birth of eco criticism because eco criticism was already there it, it is not getting born in the 1970s or 1960s specifically but post materialism 
offer a way of looking at eco critical standpoint in a different way that much i will concede okay ma'am then what is the difference between nature writing and environmental writing nature writing as i think, know that uh, the representation yes in what yes. sort poetry when nature is represented it is uh, more of a nature writing than environment hmm there is a representation from the very birth of literature but uh, uh, can they be considered environmental writing but there is no sense of urgency as you find in the ecocritical writing today yes in nature writing there is description of a particular place uh, think of dorothy wordsworth journals etc etc uh, but at the same time there is a thing called new nature writing which some people don't like the expression new nature writing but nevertheless in the so called new nature writing class of uh, literature people do engage sometimes even politically in terms of direct activism with the nature of a particular place if they find that it is getting degraded even if they have been there just for a moment and they realize something has gone horribly wrong with the way the nature over here has been treated or the people have been treated who live closest to nature and they engage with it directly and sometimes as a result of that direct engagement they go on to produce literature sometimes fictional sometimes in the form of poetry but most often in the form of non fictional prose writings so in this sense new nature write involved in eco critical activities uh hello ma'am yes hello hmm uh thank you it was uh, a very nice lecture by you and uh, you. you explain very beautifully uh, on eco criticism i have a yes. question ma'am you uh, yes. talk very nicely about uh, periphery margin and center so how could you introduce uh, this periphery and uh, center in eco criticism can you explain please yes i will do that in the second lecture that is why i did not talk about post colonial eco criticism over here in order to understand the the relationship between the periphery and the central or taking positions mm. of this sort at all whether you call one person belonging to a, the central position and the other people mm -hmm. and non human creatures belonging to the periphery this kind of mm. a position just thinking about this kind of a position is something that many many eco critics do not like at all so we will go on to that in the second lecture eventually okay ma'am thank you thank you uh i found a question from shonjit sharkar if i'm permitted to read it just for a moment uh shonjit sharkar was asking about an artificial society techno mentality uh dominance greedy dominance over nature to be extracted consumed in such a materialistic disorder kind of a thing can we how can we then listen really to the silence nature do you think that deep ecological approach might offer fundamental solution uh you see when uh, shonjit sharkar yes uh shonjit when we are talking about silence nature uh you see nature by itself i might have been talking about bird song and uh, other kinds of chirping sounds etc following rachel carson in silence thing but uh, when we are talking about silence nature don't we usually always think that nature is silent does nature inscribe its own story or do human beings anthropomorphize nature and inscribe stories on behalf of animals on behalf of nature on behalf of trees what is the what is the activity ultimately the activity is a human activity that we talk about and i am reminded of literary ecology the concept of literary ecology by joseph meeker where meeker made it very clear in 1972 in the comedy of survival that human beings of the world only literary creatures they give voice to not only their own ideas and aspirations but to what they understand to be the ideas and aspirations 
lying behind nature and non-human creatures like animals, birds, etc. So in this sense, the first part of your, your question, how can we then really listen to silence nature, may be one way of listening to the science nature is through literature. And that is why eco-criticism becomes so important in analyzing and representing this literary voice of nature to human beings in general. The other part of your question, deep ecological approach uh, could offer a fundamental solution to environmental crisis. For this part, may we think of uh, a kind of uh, criticism leveled against deep ecology. There are many people who feel that deep ecological, te the eight tenets of deep ecology sound very nice. Uh, they talk about diversity and richness of life forms which should be maintained and human beings uh, do not have any right to reduce this richness so biodiversity must be uh, retained. Um, uh, then they also talk about human interference in the non-human world should be reduced absolutely so that the situation doesn't worsen. Policies must be changed in terms of economy, technology, ideological structures. They also talk about life quality, uh, standard of living, um, how that can harm the environment uh, and ecological relations. The necessary changes must be uh, implemented immediately. All this sounds very, very good. But there are certain classes of critics who keep on saying that, after all, this, is, this sounds like something utopian in the sense that, can you really radically alter the demographic, really actually weed out human beings just like that? Then who gets killed? Who loses the right to reproduction? Do the poor people lose this right? And the rich people retain it? Do the technologically advanced people retain this right? And the technologically backward people uh, lose this right? What happens? Which class of people are we foregrounding and why? Even deep ecology, when Arnin has said that ultimately, in times of dire necessity or want, human needs will override the needs of other creatures or non-human existence then wasn't he repeating uh, in a milder form what environmentalists or other people had been trying to talk about? So I wouldn't say that deep ecology would perhaps give you the only solution right now. But yes, if environmentalists, in terms of their activism and writing, deep ecologists, eco-feminists, I would not know much about the cornucopian theorists because they are a class apart by themselves. Uh, but these kinds of people, if they come together and uh, all human beings are taught, informed about the necessities of maintaining this ecological balance, then perhaps we might find a solution. But as yet, we have reached nowhere near it. Yes. Is there any question? More? Yes. Uh, I have a question, uh, question from Debayon. Uh, Debayon yes, is asking, uh, uh, should we fall back on Tagore? Yes, of course, we should fall back on Tagore to a large extent, and that will be some part of my second uh, talk. Uh, there we will perhaps interact again about Tagore, Devayon. We have a question from Sarika Manwani. And Sarika asks, how can literary works help in bringing our consciousness in common people? As a layman doesn't read literary texts most of the time. A layman doesn't read uh, heavy literary texts, perhaps uh, 500 pages novel, perhaps. But uh, maybe a short story here. Uh, 
in a newspaper even or even if a person doesn't get to read anything doesn't have the time or the opportunity perhaps has watched a movie and in that movie somehow the message has come across that uh, look this is what people did to nature and as a result not only was nature depleted but the people also suffered as a result this is a simple kind of an example that i can think of so there are various kinds of media in which stories and life stories are told they need not necessarily be 500 pages novels or serious essays literary essays okay we will take all these kinds of things as literary texts for the purposes of ecocriticism okay uh yes uh i if you don't have any other questions uh, this is to sonmoy uh, yes ma'am uh, uh i uh, okay uh, so we will uh, move to the next session so we'll take a break uh, yes we will take a break uh, what's the time right now it's, uh, i believe 12 12 hmm? uh we will come back at uh, Half an hour from now, to twelve forty. Okay, so ma'am, uh, I don't know uh, how many of them will be able to join. Actually, it's one point five three already. Uh, it has come in, uh, so I don't know why after a month, uh, uh, a lot of data uh, getting come in. Tanmoy, you are not very audible, not very clearly audible, actually. So could you please uh, tell yes, me? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes. It's okay now. Now it's better. It's better now. Yes. Okay, ma'am. So after thirty minutes, so we will be back, ma'am. Uh, and uh, for your information, ma'am, it's actually it has consumed uh, uh, a lot of data, one point five GB. So uh, I uh, I request our uh, participants uh, to be tuned uh, after thirty minutes. That uh, is at twelve forty. Twelve forty. Okay, ma'am. Yes. Okay, ma'am. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Okay. Thank you.